uh, you know, belief in Hashem. It's, it's more about how to live our lives in a moral and ethical way, which to me is a very, is exactly up your alley in that sense. Um, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. The study Talmud personally, but I mean, in terms of understanding that, but but that's not anyway. It doesn't really matter. It's not a discussion for today. I mean, I'm, I come here because yeah, no, 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 no. It's good. No, I just wanted to put it out there because I think that your feeling. The reason why I mentioned it is that I feel that your feeling is not necessarily only just yours, but it's a it's, it's a feeling of several people, and I wanted to. So uh, I don't mind that I said that. Uh, uh, I said something about. Yes, let's yes, go ahead. Just a thought. I think where David's coming from is uh, uh, in, in things that are from ilemala lemata, from, from, from above to below, maybe there could be a problem, which is the problem of belief. So maybe we're going to switch to something that's from below to above, like a sefer achinuch, or things that are practical, more practical in the matters of things that we can do rather than and take Hashem's word or, or stick to belief. So, yeah. good, that's yeah. a good com comment. Yeah. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. I agree. Um, okay. Well, anyway, let's go ahead with, with, with Pricky Obvious for today because that's what I prepared. But I wanted to, I did want to bring it up because I wanted to get some feedback. So, I appreciate that. We'll, we'll think about it. But it's also given me. Um, more time to reflect on the style of how I, I teach it. So what I'm saying is, hey, Joe, welcome. Good to see that you're uh, all prepared. Looks like you're going to Mars over there with the, uh, with the headphones as well. It looks like you're uh, all prepared to go into space. Um, but um, what, I, what I think is important is the, the way in how things are taught to reflect the, uh, the, the people or, or how we learn things. And uh, that's what, what's important for me about feedback. So I appreciate that. And that's what I was trying to achieve today. So I hope that will reflect in what we're going to actually learn, even though we'll be continuing the same texts of Pirkei Avot. And we're up to Mishnah 9, of, uh, of Pirkei Avot, of chapter 2. Now, this is a long Mishnah, but it doesn't seem to be saying much. I'm going to read it for you, and then we're going to actually analyze and see that it could be saying a lot more than what it looks like. Oh, sorry, I didn't share my screen. I'm looking at the words without actually having shared the screen, thinking that you could see what I was saying too. My apologies. All right, so here it is. Um, Let's see if it's a relatively long um, halakha for what we're used to, Mishnah. And it's a, the last time we spoke about these type of Pirkei Avot, we haven't done that for actually about three weeks now. And we mentioned a guy by the name of Yochanan ben Zakkai. And I mentioned how Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of the most central figures in all of Jewish history, um, classified by some as the person that really started to develop the teachings of the oral tradition um, and eventually led to the ones that wrote it down. Now, Rabbi Yochanan ben Sakai um, famously has five students. He saves the Talmud, but he has five incredible students. And we're going to talk about these five students. Now, these five students are the ones that are first mentioned in the Mishnah and also some of the most mentioned rabbis in all of the Mishnah, just so you understand how important they are. Because several generations later, you have a man by the name of Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi who writes down the actual Mishnah. But what was he writing down? He was writing down from people's notebooks and discussions from teachers of previous the previous generations beforehand that started developing a more analytical way of learning the oral Torah. Okay, and I just want to give once again, what is the oral Torah? The oral Torah has numerous facets to it. Um, but most importantly, the oral Torah is the ability to know what God wanted as an interpretation of Torah. It's not something that people make up. It is a 
directly given to God by Moses to Moses at Mount Sinai. In other words, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, what we believe is that Moshe was told, here's the word in the Pasuk. Like it says in the Torah, in the Shema, we say, right? It should be as a totafot between your eyes. Um, you should tie it for a sign on your arm and you should have the totafot. Now that's all the Torah says. That's all the written Torah says. What do we do today? We wear these black boxes with things written on them and black straps, leather straps. How did we decipher? How did we get from that one line to what the Torah says? The answer that it, to that is that when Moshe was on Mount Sinai, God said, this is the line. This is what it means. Don't write down what it means. Just write down the code. And that's the code. So the written Torah is the code. The oral Torah is the is the uh, explanation, and then when they would come to a point where there wasn't a clear explanation given to Moshe, that to decipher things that weren't explained, there was a process known as the thirteen principles of derivation that we've uh, talked about in the past. Now, in this period of time, the Mishnai period, it's towards the end of the dis the, 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 the second temple era by the destruction of the temple and people realize that there's going to be more um, need to qualify and quantify and make a consensus on how laws are understood especially things that weren't given as a clear direct information and that's how we develop into the time of the Mishnah and five of those main characters that are mentioned in the Mishnah are going to be these five disciples of Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, so the Mishnah actually, in in a very different style, tells us about these five people and their qualities, which is really something that is not mentioned anywhere else in Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot is moral and ethical ethical teachings, but it decides in this Mishnah to actually talk about five of the primary rabbis. They're not the most primary, but of the most primary rabbis of the Mishnah and to tell us about them. Now, with that introduction, I want us to now look into the Mishnah and see why that is important information. Okay, so look inside the Mishnah. Now. It says, Rabbi Yochanan, a son of Zakkai, right? He's the person that saved us after the destruction of the temple and helped us set up the systems for the post temple era. That's why he is accredited to a certain degree with saving the Jewish people because he formulated Judaism post-Temple era. Now he had many students and five of them, were, his top five students were going to be the next real leaders and their teachings were going to be really meaningful for future generations. The first one, his name was Rabbi Eleazar, son of Purkinus. Now, um, we're going to talk about an incredible story. Rabbi Eleazar, the son of Purkinus, he was actually the son of people that did not believe in studying Torah. His father was extremely rich and um, uh, he leaves his father to go and study um, and ends up becoming one of the great rabbis of his time and of all Jewish history. Um, but that's an interesting story of, of its own. When students went into Eliezer bin Hulkinus, he has a fascinating life story. He ends up actually having to break away from the rabbis because he has a disagreement with them, and but we will talk about him more in detail in the future lessons. But I want to just point that out to you. Um, Rabbi Yosha, the son of Hanania, Rabbi Yosi Hakoyen, Rabbi Shimon, the son of Nisanel, and Rabbi Lazar, the son of Aaron. Now, just to point out, there is Eliezer and there is Alazar. Eliezer, the name Eliezer is the famously from, um, sorry from uh, the, the servant of Avram, his name was El Eliezer. I don't know where the name Eliezer comes from, um, other than from here. Okay, so now in an unusual manner, he's going to recount their praises. So let's see, he has five students. There was two great teachers in history that famously had five students. The other one we've already spoken about, and he lives in a, simple, a, a similar era to this time. Who was the other one that had the five students? Who? Was it Rabbi Akiva? Very good. Rabbi Akiva. 
Rabbi Akiva also has five students. But Rabbi Akiva first has 24,000 students. And then we have the spirit to Omer where 24,000 students die. And he goes and gets five remaining students and those become the primary students. And that's the next generation of primary teachers of Torah, of Torah things. And those are like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Meir. Those are also some of the most mentioned rabbis in the, all of the Mishnah. So between these five students and Rabbi Akiva's five students, you'll basically get a huge percentage of the Mishnah because these were the main core um, leaders and their students. In other words, they were the focal group of where they, they, did, or what they decided to do is create focus groups and make sure that everything, every single piece of knowledge that they had, they gave over to these people instead of just teaching the masses. And then later on, it will be given over to the masses. Okay. Now, five students is very important because um, the number five has quite a lot of significance in Judaism. Number one, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Akiva and Hillel all are considered the three of the most important figures in Jewish history and particular in the se second temple era and post temple era. These three people, Hillel, who we mentioned beforehand, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is one of the primary students of Hillel and one of the primary colleagues and students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who's not mentioned up yet, is Rabbi Akiva. All three of these people lived to the age of 120. And all three of these people are considered to be um, critical people in Jewish history. They all have something five connected to them. They all have a connection to Moshe. So it's almost like you see Moshe being reborn in these people. Moshe lives to 120. Moshe gives us the five books of the Torah. Hillel also has, I don't know if he has five students, but he sets up the whole concept of teaching and the, 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 the yeshiva system. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai has five students and lives to the age of 120, according to many opinions. And Rabbi Akiva has five primary students and lives to the age of, 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 of 120. And they're teaching. Also, hey. Sorry? Also, hey, for Moshe and Sarah from, hey, sorry, for Abraham, and Sarah, the hay changed everything for five. The hay for Avraham and Sarah, that's right. Avraham has a hay added to his name, and Sarah has a hay added to her name. Good point. Okay. So obviously the K, but where's the hay? What is the hay? What's so significant about the number five? Why is five so significant? Okay. Moshe's five is the five books of the Torah. Rabbi Yochan ben Zaki's five is his five students. Rabbi Kiva's five is also his five students. But what were they? What is five? We're told that every Jewish soul is made up of five parts. Most of us live with, on a daily basis, on a, on a minute to minute basis, the lowest part known as nefesh. Then you have the higher part, which so nefesh is connected to our basic day to day way we live. Our Ruach is our emotions, our neshama is our intellect, and then our chaya is our desires and wills, and our yechida is our essential spark. So our core essential being eternal spiritual makeup has five parts to it. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka. So the five books of Mosa are connected to the five parts of the neshama. Just like in Yom Kippur, we have five prayers. And each of those prayers goes in the five parts of the soul, right? Like we say, Ne'ila goes in the core essential pillar of the soul. So to the five students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, each were referred more to one of the five books of Moses and more particularly to one of the five parts of the soul. In other words, these people were able to each cater to a different part of the soul or the makeup of the Jewish people. That's why their teachings become so uh, prominent within Jewish teachings. Okay? Now, 
Does anybody have any other questions or comments before we go into these actual praises that, that, that we're going to mention with them? We're going to go into part two of this mission. No? Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry. Thanks, Noah. See you. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the, the praises, which is quite interesting. He, he recounts their praises. The first one he says is a man by the name of Rabbi Eliezer ben Huknus. Now he calls him, he says, first of all, he says he's a bur soich tipper. He's the son. He's like a cemented system that never loses a drop. Not a drop ever comes out of him. Then you have Yeshua ben Hananian. I'll explain to you what each of these mean as we go on. He says, fortunate is he who gave birth to him. Rabbi Yosef Akoyen is a, called, called the Chassid. Rabbi Shimon ben Nasanel is he fears sin. And Allah ben Arach is an ever-increasing wellspring. Now, I, I just wanted to show you that. Let's go. I want to stop share for a moment so that I can actually talk to you directly. All right. So who are these? What are the prizes and why are they important? First of all, what's unique about the fact that it says that he would count the praises. So the Rebbe learns out from this and some of the other commentaries, commentaries say something similar that what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka was trying to teach us is that every single Jew has their own particular praise, something that's unique to them. And what he found is he found people that were unique in their way and each had something very different to the other one, yet they were all pious, all extremely smart, all very dedicated, but they each had something unique that was going to be transformative for future of Jewish people. What's the lesson for us? That we are supposed to also find what is our unique contribution to the Jewish world. Everybody's cre created with something unique. What is your unique role and what you could uniquely and specifically give that no one else could give, or at least no one else could give to the world that you encounter as in whoever you come in contact with what is something that's unique and your praise if you were to stop and say this is my talent this is my thing some of us have figured it out and some of us haven't but that's the thing what's our praise where are we going what are we giving that's the shivchan who would make, make us their praise so let's look at them the first one is Eliezer ben Hulkinus it says that she'enei me'abed tipa we're going to see this comes out later on in the story of Eliezer ben Hulkinus, which we'll talk about in future weeks, where he doesn't forget, he would never forget anything. He had like absolute photographic memory and he remembered everything to the T. And because of that, that actually leads him to argue later on in his life against the rabbis. But what is important is that when anything had to be recalled and know with the history of it, he was like a living Google. That's what he was. Nothing slipped him. He didn't need to have it written down. He knew every single teaching backwards. And that was very important for the continuity of Judaism. The second person we have was a man by the name of Yos, uh, Yeshua ben Hanania. And it said about him that happy was the one that gave birth to him. Asher Now that's a strange praise. It's like, you know, he gave a lot of nachas to his parents. That's a funny thing to say. So there's an interesting history that we know of Yeshua ben uh, Hanania, which is that before he was born, his mother, while his mother was pregnant, his mother would travel to the different Torah studies and different Torah scholars at the time while she was pregnant and asked for a blessing from all of them. And the blessing that she asked for is that her son should be a God-fearing Torah scholar. And then when the child was born, she wanted that her child should only hear the sound of Torah study. So she spent the days of the childhood, uh, her, her, the child's awake hours inside the Torah hall. She would take the baby there 
and she would let the baby listen to the sound of study of Torah, which was an interesting thing. And we learn out from here that it's really important that we make sure that our, 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 our children hear positive things, be careful what our children actually listen to, what they hear has an ongoing impact on it. By the way, um, modern research has shown that the impacts of what happens to people in their childhood is much more powerful. The younger they are, the, the greater the impact for the rest of their life. And something that's very small in a child, in a newborn's life, can be traumatic for the rest of their life. It's funny because the Rebbe always spoke about this. From this particular praise, we learn about this story. But most people never, there wasn't much scientific research done into this. You read a book like The Boy That Was Brought Up Like a Dog or The Body Keeps a Score. A lot of these books that talk now about psychology of trauma talk about the research showing that things that happen to people as children has devastating or incredibly positive impacts for the rest of their life. So she, um, I remember when I was uh, studying in Kolel and uh, we had our, our first child. Um, so some days I would bring my uh, baby, whatever, if my wife couldn't take care of him or whatever it was, I brought him a couple of times to Kola. And I remember the, the, one of the rabbis, one of the senior rabbis in the Kola would say, oh, there's going to be a big Tamil Chacham. He's going to bring a big, big scholar because as a child, he's hearing the sound of Torah study. Okay. Now, there's another important point, which is this meaning of what, what, what's the praise of Ashtra Yaladita? Because who was the one that, that, that was clearly in the picture and responsible for Abshur ben Hananya's greatness, his mother. A lot of people are, so to speak, self-made people. Like they never had the greatest upbringing, but they still were able to, able to overcome all the difficulties. Like Rabbi Akiva, we don't necessarily say that he had a great upbringing. So the praise of Rabbi Akiva is not given to his parents. But Rabbi Shur ben Hananya is clearly a result of his mother of his mother's dedication. So therefore, when we say the praise of Rishu ben Hananya, we say, Ashrei Yolarito. Happy is the mother that gave birth to him, the one that gave birth. In other words, the praise is to his mother. His mother gave her life and dedicated everything to his success. And boy, did he, the, 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 the boy she successful in that regard. So she gets the praise. She's the one that did it all. Um, one more thing about Yeshua ben Hananya and the praise that he gets, Asher Yolarita, is that he was unique. You know, when people are born, we're born with incredible potential. And as our years go on, our potential actually becomes less to a certain degree, right? Because we've wasted time or we've, we haven't used. Rabbi Shua ben Hananya, the Rabbi learns out that he had such a strong upbringing from the moment he was born that during his life, he literally was able to live to his full potential. Okay, so that's just a few things, understanding how these praises seem somewhat small, but actually are quite incredible. The next person was... Um, Uh, one second, was um, was Yossi, um, Yossi, um, Rabbi Yossi, who we said about him that he was the, he was a chassid. What's a chassid? A chassid is a very pious person, a person with tremendously great qualities, and he was very unique that he would go beyond the letter of the law to keep Torah and also beyond the letter, beyond even put himself in, this, in, 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 in the danger to help people and do what he had to do. So he always went beyond, that's what Yechassi was. They needed someone that was willing to go beyond his own capabilities to reach this level of piety and Torah um, scholarship. The next person was 
Reb Shimon ben Asanel, and we said about Reb Shimon ben Asanel that he was, uh, he was, he feared sin. What's so important about fearing sin? Lots of people fear sin. What does that mean? That meant that he had such a strong bond with God that he was so, to him, what mattered more than anything was that connection between God. What does it mean to fear sin? Some people means I'm afraid that I'm going to go to hell and burn in hell. That's what some people think it means to fear hell, or fear sin. That doesn't take any great scholar. Nobody has to be great to make sure, you know, when somebody says that you're going to die and burn in hell, that sounds scary. So that's his greatness? No. His greatness is that he had such a strong connection with God that he was, his fear was about going against God. He didn't want to do anything that would sever his relationship with Hashem. That's what mattered to him, his relationship with God. David, I'm thinking about you when I say that, just because of our discussions at the beginning. It's a unique thing. How many people can say that they that their number one care is about what type of relationship they have with God? That was him. And he ends up becoming an important teacher of the Jewish people, known as Rabban Shimon. The last one was Rabbi Elazar ben Aruch, and who we said he was Kamayan Hamaskaba. Kamayan Hamaskaba means a fountain that is never stopping. What is it? What's so great about a fountain that never stops? The first man we spoke about, he never loses a drop. You need two types of teachers when it comes from. So you see some of these people, they're teaching, they each have a unique role in how they taught the Jewish people. One of them, the first guy we spoke about, he recorded everything. He never, ever lost to the detail. Nothing was changed even the slightest by him. That's Eliezer ben Hufnus. Eliezer ben Aro, he was able to take every single teaching, not just remember it, but see the depth and how much can be extrapolated from a single teaching. That's a fountain which is never stops to flow. In other words, he saw one word and he saw layers upon layers of potential and teachings in it. Teachers don't have to just record, like if yes, been Hufinus, just record and know the information that's extremely important. But we also need people that are able to see the strength and where the length and the breadth of Judaism. So um, when we look at these five people, what do we see? We see how far they were willing to go for the continuity and the um, retainment of the Jewish people and the Jewish teachings. Elias ben Hukas on the one hand, keeping them in their primary state and not being any way diluted. And on the other hand, Elias ben Arach, the total opposite side, where he was able to see within his teaching how much depth and layers it had and how much meaning to our own lives. That was Elias ben Arach. Okay, I'll stop there. There's a lot more to say. It's a long Mishnah. Um, but uh, there's actually, we didn't even finish it. Um, the last point, I'll just say quickly because it's, it's, it's just so that we finish the mission, but it's a whole discussion in and of itself, which we don't have time to get into, but I want to just show it to you quickly. Okay, so let's just look at it inside. Rabbi Yochanan used to say, if all the sages of Israel were to be in one cup, of a balanced scale, and then yes, the son of Prukus, who was the first one, and the other, he would outweigh them all because of his scholarship. In other words, he was measuring their, their, so to speak, what they gave to the Jewish world. Abba Shol said in Sam, if all the sages of Israel were in one cup of balanced scale, Eliezer, the son of Herkimus, included now even the first guy, but Elazar, the son of Arach, were in the other, he would outweigh them all. Now, this is a deep, it sounds like they're trying to measure who was a greatest scholar. Not at all. But what it is coming to show you is at first we say that what's the most important thing to have is somebody that's going to retain Judaism to its initial core and not change anything. That's what he has been helping us. He recorded everything with absolute detail. But the second teaching tells us, no, 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 no. That's important. 
But even more important is that God wanted us also to be able to show that, to take all of Eliezer ben Hufnes, take all the teachings, and then to be able to implement them in our lives and to grow and to make sure that we see the depth within Judaism. Don't just take things on a surface, shallow value, take them and look at them, how they are really, and what's the true meaning and what type of impact they can have on our own lives. Not just as recordings, not just as historical teachings, but as something full of value and meaning. Okay, so that's just in short, this little discussion about which way and what's most important. Ultimately, I'm, what I would say is, when we study Torah, we shouldn't just look at it, take anything on face value. We recognize that we have to retain all of the teachings and we can never discount anything. But ultimately, it's not just about retaining, it's about seeing how to implement the teachings in our lives. Okay, I've spoken enough for one day. Um, any questions, points, arguments, debates, anything? Can you start from the beginning, Rabbi? I had to take away <laughs> from my duty. <laughs> no, there was too much Sorry. today. I, 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 Sorry. <laughs> No, um, it wasn't too much, but um, a point I'd like to make, um, and it's a it's an ongoing problem, I think, is that the the an analogies, the similes, the metaphors, the examples that are used in the Mishnah of necessity are based on the lifestyle and the objects, the procedures they were familiar with at that time. And when translating, when you know, sharing the the um, principles, the concepts that the Mishnah wants to share, it'd be very helpful, I think, for, to have present day practices and objects, procedures used as the example. Um, because a lot of people nowadays, they don't even use balance scales and cups. They wouldn't yeah. understand the significance of it. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think that that's, uh, and, and I only mention this because that's the very point of, that you just made in the Mishnah, is the needs, it's not enough just to learn it academically, but to bring it into our daily lives. But the Mishnah, in the examples it uses, fails to do that. Well, what's, what's a good example of the modern day scale? As in, how would you contrast the old scale was the way you measured things was, was by contrasting it with something else of another, 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 another weight, right? That's how you weigh. Today's day and age, we don't contrast things, we just weigh. <laughs> we just weigh. It's not by contrast. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I didn't give into an analogy because I didn't think of one. And by the way, a point very well taken, and I do appreciate that. It's a very valuable point. But also, I don't. I actually can't think of a good scale. So, if anybody else could, well, I, I can think of one, but it's very dependent on your perspective. So, okay. if you put all the forty teams except for Carlton on one side of the, <laughs> <laughs> one side of the scale. Oh, no, no, yes. we can't use scale. One side of the field. Yes, and you played them against Carlton. <laughs> and ba basically, Carlton will. Uh, yeah. We'll win still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think wonderful. that's not a good example. Sorry, Mark. I love I. It's not bad for a South African, huh? It, it wouldn't it... have been bad if it was like, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you were to take, if you were to take all of the okay, this is a controversial one. I don't know if I should say. Yeah, it. here we go. All the rockets from Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to take all the Arab states and yeah. including and including whatever it is. And you put them on one side and you put Israel on the other side, they still wouldn't be able to touch the scale of Israel. Anyway, that's all I'm saying. Exactly right. Exactly right. Very true. Even if you took America with them, but then we, we're pushing it, right? Because America. Now you're pushing it. But don't forget, there have been times that Israel has fought wars against all or, 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 or some of the strongest Arab. Yeah, countries and victorious, and as a very, very young country, don't forget 1948, it wasn't even a, a state and a fought against Syria, Jordan. They weren't very successful the first time, yeah. But um, there's definitely something 
miraculous mm. about how Israel, a, a, a tiny newborn state of people, is able to fight old, powerful Soviet backed countries, yeah. big world powers. How is that? Oh, you could always give an explanation. But ultimately, I think there's something which is greater that is on our side. Exactly right. Discussion for another time as well. Mm. So we can take maybe one lesson besides for my uh, my long monologue is that we've got to find what's the really important thing that weighs everything else down. You can have all the nonsense of social media, all the nonsense of everything else in the world, and we've got to find what's the really heavyweight things? What are the things that are really important in life? And go with that. That's the important thing. I'm not, I don't know. How, I don't necessarily have the answer. I definitely have an opinion. But I'm sure each of us have our own answers in what the answer to that question is. And focus on that. Thank All right. You. David, any comments, arguments, debates? No, no, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope that. Um, Thank you very much. For very soon we'll be able to do a shoot in, in person. Whether we do it or not is a different question, but we should be able to do it. Lechayim. Amen. Okay. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.